Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Earth Institute Coffee Morning. Uh, I hope you had an enjoyable break over Easter um, and enjoyed the, uh, the sun, even despite the ferocity of the wind on Monday. Um, today, it's really my great pleasure to welcome Professor Maria Bagramian, who's the Professor of American Philosophy in the UCD School of Philosophy, uh, who's going to be talking about the question of trust in science and in experts, with particular reference to the large uh, EU project that she's coordinating for ITIA. So really, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to, uh, to join us this morning, Maria. I think this is such an important topic, and I, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So, so please, please work away. Hello, thank you, Tamsin and uh, the Earth Institute for inviting me to these talks. Uh, today, I am going to try out some of our tentative conclusions on you as a, an audience uh, that hopefully can be helpful to me in thinking through the important issues facing us. But first, let me start by saying a couple of words about the project itself. Peritia, Policy Expertise Trust, a trust in action is a, is a European Commission funded project under the Horizon 2020 scheme. Uh, it comprises of uh, 11 partnered groups across eight disciplines and it, apparently it has four consortium members. So it's a rather large project. Uh, uh, many of the participants are philosophers, but we also have scientists, social scientists, psychologists, and cognitive scientists, etc. Um, uh, the project runs for three years. It started last February. Um, in fact, it was launched on 1st of March, just before the pandemic was announced. Uh, and it's uh, officially it's to end in 2023, January of 2023, but we probably will extend it for another six months because all uh, similar projects are being automatically extended. But we have managed to do what we were expected to do in this period because, uh, as you see, because of the way the project is structured. So project is running in three phases. The first one is theoretical, uh, and the aim here is to expand and deepen the theoretical knowledge base on trust and on expertise. So we have philosophical, ethical, social, and psychological analysis of the various dimensions of trust and the determinants of trust. And that's what we have been doing in the past 11 months really after the launch of the project and uh, we'll go on to engaging with that sort of theoretical analysis for another few months. Then the second phase is empirical. The aim there is to collect data and to anal analyze the data. Uh, the and it has two components, the empirical phase. Uh, one component is to look at existing survey data and also conduct a new opinion survey across seven countries. And uh, King's College London and Bobby Duffy of the Policy Institute of King's College London is in charge of that. Uh, and then we have two experimental components, uh, one uh, conducted by Liam Delaney, whom you might remember as one of our colleagues until quite recently, he's now in LSD, and another one uh, by a team from Italy. So the idea there is that uh, the empirical phase will test some of the findings of the theoretical, more philosophical findings of the theoretical phase. So there we are trying to merge philosophy with uh, uh, empirical work. Then phase three is practical or, um, or what in the project we call ameliorative. And here the aim is to out outreach uh, uh, to the general public and to policymakers, and also to make some policy recommendations. And we are going to do that by conducting citizens for across at least five countries. And uh, also we have a youth on trust project of essay competition. And then we end the project by giving some policy recommendations to Brussels. So here are some preliminary findings. Uh, the analysis of the survey results by uh, Bobby Duffy and his team, that, that part of the project is more or less uh, concluded. And uh, what, one thing is clear that opinion surveys on trust in science show that scientists are actually are the most trusted group of 
professionals out there, which doesn't say much about other professionals, but at least scientists can take pride in this in this fact. Um, and and there, there, there is quite high level of generalized trust in science and scientists across all surveys. And I'll go through this data a bit more uh, closely with you. But uh, the levels of high trust is what is at stake. That, 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 that's where the danger signs are. So uh, the, 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 this is a general uh, overall picture of levels of trust and trustworthiness from existing data uh, in different countries. As I said, we haven't conducted our own analysis, our, our own surveys yet, that, that will come later on. But this is data from other uh, survey results. Uh, so you can see that uh, Russia is tops the bill uh, in terms of trusting science, but that might be because of the long tradition of teaching science, and, and uh, I'll mention that later on. But also they have a relatively high level of mistrust of science. And then Japan is uh, at the very bottom of the country survey, and you can guess why that is, uh, given their experience of the impact of science on their society with the atomic bomb. So, so regional uh, factors obviously will play an important role in determining levels of trust and mistrust. So you can see where US is here in this survey. It, it, it is quite low, just be above Saudi Arabia, uh, but, but we are aware of the general levels of mi mistrust of science in, in, in America. This, this is a more interesting survey because it's more nuanced. This is from Welcome Global Monitor of Trust in Science. And the reason that this is more relevant to our project and more interesting is that they make a difference between low, medium, and high trust, uh, and, and also distrust of science. And here, the, the results are quite different. So Belgium comes up top um, uh, and from the country surveyed. Why, why Bosnia Herzegovina comes the lowest. Uh, but again, from my perspective, from our perspective, the important thing is that if you look at uh, medium levels of trust, that's quite high in most countries, even in somewhere like Bosnia Herzegovina, but, but it, it, it is the, uh, levels of high trust versus low trust that are of greater relevance to our project, and we'll see why in a minute. Um, and then this is, this, this, this is the one uh, survey that most scientists like very much, which shows how scientists are the most trusted group of experts, uh, uh, follow, followed by doctors uh, and then teachers, uh, and then the army. I don't know how you, what you think of that. In America, actually, the army used to come out as the most trusted group, but things have changed. And then politicians are the lowest, uh, bankers and advertisements, uh, advertisers. Clergy have fallen down uh, very drastically. Uh, and worryingly, journalists are also low on levels of trust. Uh, but, but if we rely just on this, uh, uh, particular survey, we might think that there is no issue about trust in science because scientists are the most trusted group of experts. Uh, so so there, there, there are regional variations, obviously, in levels of trust. Um, uh, but globally, only 18% of people have a high level of trust in scientists, while 54% have a medium level of trust, and 14% have low level of trust. Uh, trust. This, 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 this is the global result. If you look at particular countries, Belgium is among the most trusting of nations with 43% of high trust in scientists and 8% of low trust, while Montenegro is the opposite. Uh, and within Europe, Northern Europe reports high levels of trust in science, 33%, while Eastern Europe uh, is, is uh, presents low level of trust. Uh, so the hypothesis I want to discuss with you uh, is that high levels of trust in science is, call, is called for where there is much at stake versus health, profit, comfort. Uh, what, uh, what, and 
different accounts of trust may work better where high or low levels of trust are at stake. So what, what, what I should explain that one puzzle out there is that we all are talking constantly about uh, breakdown of trust, but the surveys don't report, don't, don't support that. So some, there's some sort of uh, lack of uh, parity between survey results and our general perception of breakdown of trust. Now the breakdown, the perception of breakdown of trust, of course, has come in part uh, from the uh, rise of populism and populist leaders who have called science into question, and also the vocal uh, defense and propagation of conspiracy theories uh, and misinformation about science that we see on the internet. Uh, but but uh, that, that sort of level of uh, mistrust, is, as, as you saw, is not really out there when you look at the survey results. So how are we to explain the, the, this differences between high and low level, lower levels of trust? Maybe an example from trust in medical expertise can help. Um, in a, a recent survey of trust in medical science, 89% of respondents across Europe said that they trusted medical advice for medical workers greatly. So, uh, uh, or at least some or a lot. By contrast, uh, they trust medical uh, advice from governmental sources far less, uh, about 69%, which is a substantial number, but only 69% said that they trust uh, medical advice given by government uh, on medical issues. Uh, but the data has an interesting and maybe unexpected twist, which goes into confirming the sort of hypothesis that we are developing. So here is uh, a comparison between trusting scientists in general versus trusting COVID-19 scientists, including medical experts who are advising on COVID-19. Uh, you, you can see that initially trusting uh, scientists in general and COVID-19 scientists started more or less at the same place. And then uh, there, there has been uh, there have been several dips in the trust in uh, uh, UK government on actions to deal with COVID-19 and the scientists who advise them, while the levels of trust in scientists in general has remained more constant. And now there is a substantial gap in trust in scientists as expressed as this general attitude of trust versus trust in scientists who advise on COVID-19 cases. So, so uh, part of our hypothesis is that this, this difference is explained by the fact that trust in COVID-19 scientists is a high stake trust. You have something at stake in terms of your personal freedoms, in terms of uh, the medical route you take towards vaccination or uh, health advice you accept, etc. These have consequences. While well, just saying that I trust science, that's a low stake trust. Uh, just as an aside, I think it's, it's also clear that how experts present themselves is quite important and it should be taken into account by any scientist that's here, that's appearing as expert. Uh, aggressive language, arrogant language decreases the credibility uh, of the scientific advice and has impact on the levels of trust uh, in science. So, so our project has several concerns about the result, the survey results. Uh, uh, one is that there's a potential gap between questions of abstract trust as measured in surveys and applied or active trust as enacted in everyday life. Uh, and also interpersonal trust measures in uh, uh, social surveys are relatively weak predictors of actual trusting behavior. So Nora O'Neill, for instance, has said that instead of crisis of trust, maybe we should talk about the culture of suspicion rather than always harking on about culture of trust. Uh, 
But there are also deeper conceptual issues involved when we look at the survey results, because the nature and function of trust in science is not clear. Everyone is talking about trust. I mean, the number of times I hear the word trust from news, etc., is really <laughs> quite uh, jarring. In fact, it's as if everyone is talking about trust, and I don't think that's very enjoyable when you're when trust is your uh, topic of your research. But also there. There, there, there are quite a few points of lack of clarity in discussions of trust when it comes to science advice, because as Catherine Holst uh, from University of Oslo, one of our science, one of our partner institutions has shown, uh, science advice is generally uh, delivered by committees and not individuals. So this sort of individualistic model of trust that people use is not really relevant or useful for, for uh, science advice. Uh, but then if you go to institutional accounts of science and trust in science as an institution, that's just too vague and too broad, and that's not very useful either. Uh, I'm going to skip a couple of uh, slides and just finish by uh, talking a bit about what sort of trust is at stake uh, when we are talking about trust in science. So there are, in, among philosophers, there are two main accounts of trust. One is known as predictive account. Uh, where to trust someone is to form an expectation that the person will behave as agreed or required by the situation. Predictive accounts of trust in science imply trusting someone is simply a matter of incorporating her anticipated action into your plan. Uh, then this is uh, contrasted with normative accounts of science. That is to trust someone is to form an expectation about how the person you trust ought to behave. And I support this account of trust, the normative account of trust. But which account is uh, more useful for trust in science? Uh, the predictive accounts based on are, are based on objective criteria of scientific practices uh, and the procedures of science. These procedures, the idea is when uh, followed with integrity are sufficient grounds for tr trust. Uh, but the objection to this view is that making plans on the basis of a person's predicted behavior by itself is not trust, but mere reliance. The normative, on the other hand, is much more demanding. It encompasses a range of claims. So this is something that uh, with my postdoc, Michelle Croce, uh, we have published recently, it's coming out next month, actually. So, so the normative accounts crucially uh, involves an expectation of goodwill from the people you trust uh, uh, and, and has uh, places a greater deal of responsibility on the person you trust. Uh, the normative account also justifies feelings of betrayal and not just uh, disappointment when trust is broke broken. The predictive account does not account for the sense of betrayal or uh, does not involve the expectations of goodwill. Uh, so the tentative conclusion I want to put to you is that high stake trust requires this normative version of trust. So it comes to health, or our well-being, etc. While uh, the low-stake trust, which many uh, people on surveys are willing to uh, espouse, that is based on predictive trust or mere reliance account of trust. So I'll stop here, um, and hopefully I'll get some questions and more importantly, some pushbacks because that's how philosophy works. If you get criticism, you're doing well. That's great. Thanks very much indeed, Maria. Really interesting. Um, does anybody have any questions initially? I, I, I have one. I was really interested in that kind of divergence there between, you know, with, with the COVID advice and also uh, triggered by your comment on, on the kind of the atom bomb in, in Japan. And I wondered about the degree to which people sort of are seeing the science 
it's an understanding the science itself or really they're responding more to how it's interpreted and applied and then you know in the covid situation you know that has been one of the rare situations we actually have had scientists standing alongside politicians more often what you see is the politicians applying the evidence in in bringing in societal and political and economic considerations as well and people i think through the covid crisis people are becoming increasingly disenchanted that they start to they just want to hear what they what they want to hear mm. and and they kind of the scientists maybe can be blamed but really it's the politicians that are that are making the decisions and and disregarding some aspects of the science just to, to suit their perspective so to me I guess, so it's interesting that that kind of the degree to which people really are, are, are trusting the scientists or, or having their trust in the scientists eroded or or whether it's to do with how the science is used that's that's one of the things mm -hmm. that's driving people's perspectives yes that 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 is really a crucial question and uh, uh, the whole issue of trust in science is really becomes really central when we are talking about science used for policy advice and that that is the focus of our project uh, if if you, if you ask people if they trust astrophysicists you know they would i said uh, you know usually they would say yes because they think that these are clever people doing their own thing and maybe from time to time send us very beautiful pictures of the universe uh, it, but but they have very little impact uh, on policy decisions uh but but uh, it, it is very important I, I i should add that conceptually to distinguish between trust in policy as such and trust in the science that goes into policy and these questions the questionnaires were really about trust in science but we, we are surmising that in somewhere like japan there's low level of trust because they think scientists are giving bad advice on what uh, or, or at least they are not refraining from the sort of advice that will lead to dropping bombs on Hiroshima. They didn't need to give the secrets of the atomic bomb to the American government. So, so, so that that. But it's it's difficult to guess these things just through these, these uh, formal surveys. Uh, face-to-face -face encounters will clarify these things much more. And that's part of what we are going to do in the phase three of the project when we are having citizen assemblies. There's a question from Tom Bolger in the chat, um, which is, is the reason why the medium level of confidence is prevalent because of cognitive dissonance? So can, can Tom explain that a bit more? What sort of uh, cognitive dissonance do you have in mind, Tom? Tom, do you want to, to um, speak in, re in response to that? Hi. Hi. I suppose I, I suppose I mean, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I suppose I mean, um, for example, in the banking crisis of years ago, they, uh, people sort of accepted that the banks couldn't be functioning as they, as they, uh, as they said they were, but they yet they yet they continued to uh, believe that things couldn't be as the scientists or as the economists, if you like, mm -hmm. were saying at the time. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if climate change, for example, is another one of these. Your average punter probably believes that climate change is a factor, but yet is not prepared to accept the things that we need to do about it. Okay. Right. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, a few uh, responses to what you have said, because this is an important point. Firstly, economists are among the, the low, uh, but, but if most people don't consider economists as scientists, but if you ask them if they trust economists, they would say no. And it's thought that, 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 that when, when uh, they question of uh, trust in science comes up. There's a distinction made between human sciences and natural sciences, but that's something that, that we need to look into more closely, and these surveys don't, don't show it. Uh, when it comes to climate science, it's very difficult to, to explain why there is such level of mistrust in climate science, uh, other than by referring to two issues. One is what Naomi Oreskes has talked about, the merchants of doubt, sort of outside influences. 
But I think there is a further explanation, and this is part of the hypothesis that we are pushing, that, that climate science, uh, trust in climate science involves high stake trust because of the impact on our ways of life, et cetera, particularly when it comes to people who will be directly affected by uh, the measures introduced uh, to mitigate climate change, versus farmers, et cetera. So it, it is difficult, more difficult, more demanding to have trust in cases where high stake trust is in, in, in involved. And uh, we, we really need to set the two types of trust apart and look at each case separately. But the general discussions of trust in science don't do that. They treat trust as if it's a unitary notion. Um, the claim is that it's not. Is that okay, Tom? I think Patrick has a question. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Hi, Maria. Thanks for the I'm talk. Um, so, as an economist, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, and I, I'm really taken by the, the normative thing at the end, you know, uh, the level of trust. So, when I'm thinking about how economics in theory models things like so obviously the more traditional one is about you know people what we call being utilitarian just completely self-interested you know just maximizing their own satisfaction you know but then in game theory think of the prisoner's dilemma you know when you actually model an equilibrium it's incentive compatible you can trust people to do something if you take an action but they've no incentive to deviate from their action given that you've committed to your action and vice versa right and that's the definition and that sort of nash equilibrium is part of a lot of economic modeling as well um, but there is a last bit of economic modeling which is um the reason why we did have independent central banking this idea of you know credibly committing to an institution that would always avoid inflation. This is like Germany after the war, you know what I mean? They set up their independent bank and they wanted to be free of politics, free of government, free of everything, that they would just, you know, everyone could trust them that they would always, you know, keep inflation low. And that's what they commit to and they don't deviate from that, you know? Um, so I just find this kind of concept. So one way I thought of getting at this more from a political science point of view was when I was looking at your questionnaire, I always had this idea that the Whitakers of the world, and going back to the 50s, that the bureaucrats in, in government, um, long-term civil servants, the permanent administration, they, they should be more people committed to the public sphere. They should have the more long-term view. Um, mm -hmm. And now we've diluted that, you know, in the sense that we have the HA, like we've quangos and consultants and. Uh, you know, PR people and then politicians are politicians. I mean, they have to get voted over five year cycles or whatever it is, right? So their horizons are different. Um, so I'm just kind of thinking that, uh, like, what in this normative sense, you know, you can trust a parent to be maybe always, uh, you know, loyal to their children no matter what, you know, not always, but, you know, in general, can you trust a bureaucrat to always put the public interest first? mad scientist in a lab to always want to just cure cancer and that's the end of it you know like so i'm just kind of getting at that that nature it's really interesting that you've done it theoretically you've made the point clear theoretically what i'm trying to get at is how empirically we disentangle uh, that, that the nature of trust really and what it's about like are you looking for is it transactional are you trying to anticipate what others are responding to you like, mm -hmm. is it just your own, you know, and I know you're getting that theoretically, but empirically, that's that's a quite difficult one. To so, so, so we are hoping to test some of uh, the, these uh, theoretical issues uh, through behavioral economics with Liam Delaney and uh, his team now at LSE and also through uh, a team in Milan. So, so we are hoping to find the empirical parallels to, to our theoretical claims. I mean, philosophy, this distinction between reliance and trust is quite well established, uh, just to give you a flavor of the sort of things that philosophers say. And it may very, very famously said, a detective can rely on a burglar to take 
to direct him to the loot because of his standard behavior in doing these things. But you can't say that the de detective trusts the, uh, uh, the the burglar. So, so there's a difference between she claims between what is involved in trust and mere reliance. So, so uh, in, in case of scientists. The objective is the accounts of science say that, well, we can rely on science because they do the right thing. If they're honest and have integrity, et cetera, then they'll do the right thing because the methodology of science requires them to do the right thing. But the normative account of science that goes with this normative account of trust says that no, values are involved at a foundational level in science, not just economics, but in other sciences as well, an expression of goodwill. I mean, there's a big, big debate here and I won't go into it, but, but, but the question, the, the, the topic you have raised is quite murky and very difficult even at the philosophical level, let alone at the empirical level. But we hope to have some results about that in about a year's time after Liam and others have tried to translate our theoretical findings into empirical experiments. Thanks, thanks for your question. Thanks for the really fa fascinating conversation and lots of more questions. I, I have quite a few more myself, but we're running out of time. Uh, there's, there's a question um, in, the, in the chat that's been there for a little while now from Adam Kane. Uh, do you think celebrity scientists are good for promoting public trust in their fields? No, no, I, I, I have had debates about this with people who think that celebrity scientists are a good thing. No, I don't think so. Firstly, science advice, as I mentioned, comes from groups of scientists and that it's good that it does that. You know, there, there, there are advantages to have group think in science. There are some disadvantages as well because it leads to some levels of conservatism, but overall the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Relying on celebrity scientists, the problem is that Scientists are human beings. They are they, they, they are prone to mistakes. But they're also pr prone to personal mistakes, which and then their credibility. Once their credibility is called into question in their per in the personal arena, then ho the whole science is also called into question. So, so I think we should not go for uh, even though it's a quicker route to gain. Uh, maybe some 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 uh, credibility for science from the pu public but it's a dangerous route and i i personally am against that but maybe you disagree with it thank you yeah no i think that's true that's interesting i mean it kind of draws attention to science and gives a profile but it doesn't necessarily improve its, its credibility i guess exactly exactly it's a quick quick solution <laughs> but the long term is not the right solution yeah Okay, listen. So um, I know there are there are other questions, but I know that we're also out of out of time. So um, I think we we better leave it there. But I, I, with with regret, <laughs> leave it there. And I'd like to thank Mar Maria again for joining us this morning. For a really interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Many thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye.